I wanted to start out before we jump into our core value and um, I have actually have a black eye on my face. Um, I knew that this series and was going to. I didn't gonna, do it. I knew <laughs> that this series was going to be tough. I didn't know that someone would get so angry um, that their toes were set on so much that they would hit me in the face. I'm joking. That is not what happened at all. Um, so my, my son actually, there's been a debate in the house on who has the hardest head in the house. And so um, his head collided with my face and he won. So um, anyway, but we're so excited to jump into this message and, um, and, and wrap it up really kind of full circle with Je- following Jesus and what that means as we make disciples. And, you know, last week we did kind of end in this tension of you evaluating where, where am I in my process of discipleship and of making disciples. Um, and we think it's okay and necessary to sit in the tension of, uh, of allowing God to speak to you. But I also pray that today is going to be very encouraging for you, that I think that many of you might be further along in the process of being a disciple maker than what you think. Um, and so we'll jump into why I think that in just a second. But first, let's start with our core value that we're going to cover today. We're specifically going to be talking about your place in God's church and the methods of Jesus. And so last week we talked about the mission of Jesus, the Great Commission to go and make disciples. Today, how did he do that? Um, And we talk about how we're a covenant community committed to Jesus' method of discipleship through groups. um, That's, we're talking about community, prayer or intimacy and service. And that's that missionality. Um, And so groups, prayer and service, you might see it on our wall, that GPS. Um, And so we're going to jump straight into that. But, you know, when we look at how did Jesus actually disciple, what are his methods, I think it's super important that first um, we we, we talk about what discipleship is and what it's not. Most of us in this room probably when we hear the word discipleship, one of the reasons you might have been possibly discouraged last week if you felt like you weren't making disciples is because we equate discipleship with sitting in a class and learning scripture scriptural facts. We have this tendency to think discipleship is going to a course, taking a 101, 201, 301 on theology, and now, ta-da, I am officially discipled. But we don't see Jesus discipling like that. That is not his method. That was not the apostles' method of discipleship, and that's not the method that actually makes disciples. Um, we, what we see when we look at Jesus and how he brought people in, how he brought them from babies or from the lost, actually, into first chair, second chair, third chair, fourth chair, is what we call Jesus-style discipleship being intentional, relational apprenticeship. Intentional, relational apprenticeship. What we see Jesus doing is almost immersive style learning where he invites people to come follow him into his sphere as he is serving the lost, as he's serving others, he invites them into his life. We see Jesus letting these disciples come close to him, eating with them, praying with them, watching him heal, watching him serve others, watching him teach and to pray. And then he starts to empower them. It's almost like an on-the-go training. This is an apprenticeship. We sat around here a long time, a lot more things are caught than they are taught. And if you're, if we, I know we have some teachers in here. If you're a teacher, you understand that how children, but I would say not just children, all of us, how we learn um, is immersive learning is the best style of learning. We learn by doing, we learn by being baptized in something, not just hearing it with our, with our, you know, with our ears, but actually getting to practice what we were doing. And so, you know, I think that we understand this so much that the best, the people that understand concepts the most are the ones who are actually doing it, who have practiced it. And so if you were going to have surgery, let's say you needed a heart surgery, um, how confident would you be that your heart surgeon only had a PhD? Super smart fella, but only had a PhD, never went to resident, never had residency or fellowship, never watched another surgeon do an actual surgery, never practiced doing surgery with a, with a trained surgeon next to him. He only learned about it in a book. You and I both know we would not be comfortable with that because that's just not the best style for learning if you're going to do and if you're going to apply. And so to be a disciple is absolutely learning scripture and sitting under teaching, but it's so much more than that. It's um, interactive learning through immersive apprenticeship. Um, and so that's kind of what we're looking at today. And I want you to understand that, um, that Jesus' method of discipling, he had a small group right? He had a small group, a few guys. He invited him to his, into his life. He spent about three years. They didn't have a small group that met for 45 years. He had about three years, and it was so effective that in 200 years, the Roman Empire had converted to Christianity. Right. 
And when you look at Jesus' style, it wasn't just me teach you and you do it. It, it, there, was a, there was a process that he took them along. If you look early on in the Gospels, and most of what you see is Jesus doing things. And then, then he starts to incorporate his disciples in some of the work. He, he starts where he's feeding the 5,000 and he's, uh, you know, ha- have them sit down. What did you find? You know, what lunch did you find? And, and then he prays over it and he has them give it out and distribute it. And so there's this process of where they're doing it with him right there beside him. And then he begins to send them out with him kind of overseeing it from a distance. In Luke 9 and 10, he sends different groups of people out, and they preach the gospel, they heal the sick, they cast out demons, and then they come back and they report to Jesus about what's taking place. And, and along the way, he's correcting things, he's teaching them, he's showing them the heartbeat of things, and you know why, the why behind the what, and, and all of those things along the way. And then finally, he uh, tells them, go to the upper room, I'm going to send you this empowerment, and it's going to enable you to be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And then he ascends into heaven, and then they're there. They are there to continue out the ministry. And so you see that process uh, along the way. And then from there in Acts chapter 2 is where you see what the church did. And so in Acts chapter 2, verse 41... We see it says that those who believed what Peter said were baptized and they, they were added to the church, about 3,000 in all. And then all of the believers devoted themselves. Say that word, all. You know what that means? Good job. It means every one of them. It wasn't selective. So the the people who were believers, they devoted themselves. Now, this devotion isn't like what we have where we read a daily devotion that you're really probably not that devoted to. You read it, and then you miss a few days, and then you catch up and all that stuff. Like It's not that. This devotion is a is a deep commitment. It's like a covenant. It's a, it's a devotion like in between a husband and wife. It's a devotion even to the point of, of death, even when he says, I will make you my witness, that word witness is the Greek word martus, which is this word that we get the word martyr from. So he's even telling them, I'm going to empower you to the point of where you're willing to lay down your life. It says all of them were devoted, and then it lists some things, to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, sharing in meals together, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. I want you to notice something else there. There's a key word of and. In that it's not or they weren't devoted to the apostles' teaching or to fellowship or to prayer. It was they were all devoted to all of these things, and because of that, a deep sense of awe came upon them all. And uh, the apostles performed many signs and wonders, and the believers, all the believers, met together in one place, and they shared everything that they had. They sold their property and possessions. They shared money with those in need. They worshipped together. At the temple and in their homes, uh, they met uh, for the Lord's Supper and and shared their meals together with great joy and generosity. And so here's another aspect that's important. They didn't meet in the temple or in home. It was both. You know, a lot of times people put the focus on the temple. We've all got to be together among the congregation, and, and they put a high focus on that. Other places, they've written out the temple altogether, and you just need your small group, and you need your home group. But here, you see that they did both. It wasn't either or. It was both and. It said they sold their property and possessions, gave to all who were in need. They worshiped together in the temple. I'm sorry, met in homes in the Lord's Supper, shared the meals together with great joy and generosity. All They, they were uh, praising God and enjoying the goodwill uh, of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their number those that were being saved. And so all of the believers were devoted to some things. The apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing of meals, which included communion, and then uh, to prayer. They they had all four of these things together that they were committed to. And so we're going to look at kind of what our compass is that gets us there. And uh, we've got it on our wall, and we've talked about this before But we kind of have a GPS of how we begin to see, uh, based on these scriptures and stuff, what we see the church did to accomplish that task. And the first one, the G, is groups or community. Yeah, and so when I think about uh, think about community and groups, you know, I think a lot of churches in America would have small groups, 
But what we were talking about, obviously when we stare at the book of Acts and we really read about this thing, it, it definitely seems different from even your, av- your average small group in an American church. This was a covenant community that literally shared their lives with one another. Um, and they had, it says that they had no needy among them because if someone had a need, they were selling their stuff and just providing for one another's need. They were committed and devoted to their own personal discipleship and to one another. And so this is a, a deep community. And I think that, you know, there's been a huge movement, especially in the Western um, world to deconstruct church. And I think a dissatisfaction, especially among Gen Z, to come in and to be a part of something that's superficial or that you attend that doesn't have real depth. And I think all of us would look at Acts and we'd say, I want that. I want to be a part of that. Um, I want to have that. But I think we also have to recognize our own tendency as Americans that we desire instant gratification. Yeah. Because for the most part, we can have it our way right away at Burger King, right? Like we can go wherever we want and get whatever we want almost immediately. We can add it to our Amazon uh, cart and immediately have it. And what I want you to see is that this required all the believers to have buy-in. It wasn't actually something that could be done by a decree or a mandate from people up top. And now here I have this depth of relationship and this community that I've been wanting. It took a devotion and all the believers having buy-in. There was a cost and a covenant. There was a cost to each of them to decide I'm going to give of myself and there was a commitment to one another that ran really really deep and that they there was an interdependency among them and so I want you to think of this less this type of community less like something I would add to my Amazon cart and more like I feel like a really good image of this would be a community garden it's a community garden that every single one of us, if we're going to want the fruit out of it, are responsible to tend together. That we all see we have this mutual responsibility to pull out the weeds, to tend the soil, to, 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 to do the things necessary in our own sphere to take care of the community together. There was a cost and the covenant, and it was pretty beautiful. And so we want to notice three things about these groups. What did, When we say groups or community, what did the actual Acts church look like, this early church? What did their small groups look like. Um, And the first, I think they were marked by this radical, sacrificial generosity, a radical, sacrificial generosity. This wasn't one or two people. It said all of the believers were devoted in this way to one another, all of them. They were all had this vulnerability, this desire to come together and to serve one another and to be this. And guys, I just in love, I want to just say, I think that it's really hard to unpack and to deconstruct in our own selves this consumer mentality. Because what I've seen happen is even if you don't have church here, like you go to the movies, some people that consumer mentality is so deep that they'll treat their small group like something that's a, they come to small groups with consumer mentality. And it'll be the same people opening their homes every single time and also having it cleaned before, having it cleaned after, providing all the meals. And people come in and it's their chance for free therapy or a girl's night out and a laugh and they leave and it's about them still. But you don't see the community and acts that look like that at all. That was not what small groups look like. They were organic communities that saw every single one of us have a place here. Every single one of us has something inside of us that's unique that God called me and asked of me. And I have a contribution to this community garden. It's not something I go order up. It's something that's going to cost me. And I think that that's an important thing that you bring up. But kind of the other side of it is sometimes we'll hide our need or whatever because we don't want to be the one who seems like we're taking. Listen, there's going to be sometimes that you withdraw from the community aspect of things and you're the one that's being ministered to. But And there's nothing wrong with that for times and seasons. But then there also needs to be a time and season where you're the one that's invested. And it, it, it kind of goes both ways because sometimes people will hear that and be like, well, I, I don't want to be the person who needs the therapy or the prayer or whatever, so they don't say anything. But it's important, that vulnerability and, and thing, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more later on, is a, a very important aspect of this. That, that that community mindset is we all have something to offer uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, it says that he makes the whole body to fit together perfectly as each part has its own special work. And it helps the other parts to grow so that the whole body is healthy and, and is growing and is full of love. Yeah, I mean, I think, 
when you think about the human body, which the scripture compares the body of Christ, that he's the head and we're the body, that each part is beneficial and each part has a role. And so, you know, if I, if you've ever hurt your toe, you know, you have like a baby toe that is hurt, you will walk funny on that foot to protect that little toe. Walking funny sets your leg off, which makes your back hurt. I mean, it sets the, it can set the whole body's gait off because of one tiny right. part. And so it's really important that we all understand that we each have a critical role. You have something to offer the body of Christ. Right. And just like if there's any part on your physical body that is hurting or not functioning, the goal is to get it healthy and for us to minister to one another so that the whole body can, can do its part and to be in its place. And we see this in 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 26. If one part suffers, it says, all the parts suffer with it. If one part's honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. Um, just before that, it says in verse 20, yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And according to Corinthians, what he and I are doing up here, the most visible parts deserve the least honor. The most honorable parts are the parts that we that are hidden in the behind the scenes. Many of the things that happen here at iHeart, you might never know the name of someone who does it. It does not make them them less valuable. And so it's saying that you have a part, not just the big temple on Sundays, but you have a critical part in small groups. And what happens when we have small, smaller groups is that every voice has a chance to be heard. Right. Every body has the chance to do what God has equipped them uniquely to do and to, and, to, and to be a part of. And so, you know, I think this communal unity and love, and we've seen this. We've seen how in times in our life um, with loss, with tragedy, with heartache, with financial hardships, that we've both been the part that at one point in time could give sacrificially to someone we loved because they were in need. And then we've been the people that have needed ourselves and that people have right. given to. And this is how the body of Christ is designed to work. But it requires this buy-in from all of us in an understanding that any deep relationship is going to require investment. And guys, it may not come like automatically immediately, that it takes a little bit of work and effort and, and a putting in of yourself and investment. Um, so the first thing we note about the early church is they had this radical sacrificial generosity. Um, and then we also see this consistent gathering in the temple for corporate worship or this big worship. Don't you think it's interesting that 3,000 people now we see this, this instance, 3,000 people. This is larger than any church in West Virginia. So 3,000 people. I think it is a fallacy to believe that you can't grow and stay small. Right. They are showing us it is possible for people to be added daily to the kingdom of God and for the church to rapidly grow. And if the structure and the model is still there, you can still have this type of community, even if the community right. is large. Well, that's how the church grew at that point. You know, there is a, uh, a mentality that a church has to stay small in order to protect that community and everything. But if the church is staying small, there's not new believers coming in. There's not uh, the outreach. There's not the... The, the new people being in, brought into the family of God. And so, it, it's again, it's not I either have to have a small church and be discipled, or if I go to a big church, I'm not going to be able to be discipled. It's through this avenue of, of meeting together. So they met together in the temple. But the third thing is you see that they gathered together in their homes. They shared meals. They prayed. They studied the word of God together. And, and they enjoyed one another. And so it's the two aspects that allows, even as the church grows, which is God's will, he wants his church to grow. He wants more people being saved. He wants people to grow spiritually and be more mature and, and all of those things. As the church continues to grow, that it also can grow spiritually when we are intentional about those smaller group me meetings and connection points through prayer and the study of God's word. Yeah, and so you see this need for both um, as long as we're allowed to. You know, I feel like, you know, the Bible's pretty clear as we head toward end days. We may not always have the ability to meet in large groups like this with, as persecution will increase. Before Jesus comes back, this may not we may not have this opportunity. Um, but we see that while we do, this is an equipping zone, a place for us to be inspired by one another, encouraged by one another. And so I want you to understand that this there has to be any healthy small group is connected to the whole body. Right. Any healthy church is connected to the global body of church. When you see a rogue small group, a rogue church, you should beware because things get really weird really fast. Even in Corinthians, among the 
the, the churches that were connected to the apostles, we see weird stuff happening and them having to correct. And so this is a place, though, that we come together to be strengthened for accountability and that we connect to something that's larger than us. Yeah. And we come in here on Sundays, I know sometimes just listening to you guys sing, like hearing, I mean, it just feels like a, t- a taste of heaven of what it's going to be like when we're mingling our faith together in corporate worship. It's so beautiful. And I think that to understand that sometimes this is necessary if your small group's even having a hard time, to that reminder, that anchor to something being a part of the global body, um, I like to say the all comes from the all. The all comes from the all. It's like when you sit in this room, you think, wow, believers are doing this all over the world. Right. We're not unique. It's not just us that's struggling. In the epistles, it says, keep a reminder that your brothers and sisters all over the world are facing the same struggles. So this reminds us that we're in this together, and that's why the temple is so, so valuable. And so, yes, they met in the temple, and they also met in homes Uh, But I want to emphasize here the need for us to be sure that small groups, that we understand what small groups are for. And that they are for um, uh, studying the scripture and those elements of studying the scriptures and praying together and eating together. um, That that is what a true Acts small group looked like. They weren't girls night outs. They weren't therapy sessions. There was an intentionality about these groups that they prayed together, they served together. These communities had buy-in. And there was a very intentional purpose of this, of vulnerability, of opening their hearts to one another. Um, and, and I think in our culture, again, as Americans, I'm not knocking Americans. I'm just saying we have to understand what our uh, tendencies are toward. And we have a tendency in our culture it's, I mean, we're the land of the free and the home of the brave. We're the independents. Like, we are very independent, and we pride ourselves on how hard we work and how independent we are. We like our giant square footage, and, any, and all of us each had our own room, and, and we can shut people out, and this is my space and my time. And we've really lost the very, very biblical concept of hospitality. Hospitality runs deep all the way from Genesis to Revelation. As a matter of fact, you may not know this, but at one point in the old prophet, in the major prophets, it tells us that one of the major reasons God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of because they were inhospitable to people who were hurting. They wouldn't welcome people in. As a matter of fact, when when it gives the qualifications for a leader or for an elder in the church, most of us would put things like, you know, you have to have a solid marriage. You have to have a good reputation. You can't be drunk with wine. But every single time it lists a qualification for a deacon that's a ministry leader or an elder, it says they have to be given to hospitality. They have to have a heart that is willing to open up their home and to share their lives. And if we're not careful, we, we have to be intentional about opening our hearts, opening our lives to other people to allow them in. I know when I open my home to someone, it is vulnerable. It requires that they might see messes in my house. They may see things that need to be fixed. They may see dog hair clumps in the, on, the, on the floor. They, if I make a meal for them, they may not like it. I may put my heart into this, and they don't. it requires something. But listen, that's the point. The point is that we need one another, and God delights in us sharing our weaknesses with one another and giving of ourselves. And this is what we see this community really about. And, guys, when we talk about small groups, this is our target. And it takes a little bit of work. You might not go to a small group the first time, and that's your group. It's definitely yours. It might be meeting, trying a few groups and figuring it out. And then even the group that you are a fit for, it's going to take some work. It might be awkward. In the, first, in, in the beginning. I think sometimes it's awkward even being around your own family. Let's just be honest. Like even your family dinner sometimes are awkward. We don't just leave our families. There's a commitment to one another, and this runs really deep. And this is what community really looked like in Scripture. Um, yeah. These were biblical disciples in relational environments. Yeah. Paul wrote to the church in Rome in Romans chapter 12, and he said, always be eager to practice ho- hospitality. Not, not, not just occasionally. Like there, there should be a desire to meet with other people in our home and connect with them uh, as well. In Hebrews chapter 13, it says to keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. And don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some have done this and entertained angels without even realizing it. And I, and I think this is something that's important. Uh, I, I think there's a season and stuff where when we're trying to connect in, that we can connect in with, with people that, are, that we know. And that's a great starting place for intentional discipleship and things. But as the church grows and new people begin to connect in, they need a place as well. And, and so even like this, this uh, being hospitable to stranger, 
it means like invite someone else into the group to, to be a part of that group and bring them in and introduce them. You know, Paul would not have connected into the disciples uh, had it not, or apostles had it not been Such for Barnabas. Barnabas came and brought Paul in and vouched for him and said, hey, no, he's not the crazy guy who's killing the church anymore and everything. And just imagine two-thirds of the New Testament was written by Paul, and we're reading a lot of his letters and things that we have. But that wouldn't have happened had Barnabas not been hospitable to Paul in order to bring him in. And you look at what how the church would have been affected. And sometimes the, the piece of the puzzle that we need the most is the stranger that we haven't been willing to invite wow. in yet. And, wow. and that, you know, even that about entertaining angels unaware, I believe it, it could even just be, uh, uh, you know, the, the word for angel in the Greek is angelos, which just means a messenger. It may be that that person isn't necessarily an angel that came from heaven and, you know, and has, has been around the throne, but it's somebody who has a word or a message or something that's going to benefit your group, your church, your, you know, and, and all of that. And we don't take it in because... They're not a part of the group that we're comfortable with. And, uh, and then in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Most important, show a deep love for each other because love covers a multitude of sin. As you are meeting together with people, there are going to be conflicts that come up. There's going to be disagreements. There's going to be offenses. There's going to be things. But it's that love for one another that helps push past that. And then it says, cheerfully. Say that with me, cheerfully. So it's not like, oh, Lord, they're going to make me host a small group. Like, No, like God wants us, same way he wants us to be cheerful givers. He wants us to bring worship with a heart of thanksgiving and even our prayers with thanksgiving and cheerfulness and stuff. He wants us to cheerfully share our home with those who are in need, who need a place or a place to stay. God has given each of us a, uh, a gift from his variety of spiritual gifts. So use them to serve one another. And, and I think this is one thing. We have to stop comparing ourselves with others. Like, I, I can't teach the Bible like this person, or I can't pray like this person, or sing like this person, or I don't get the revelation like this person. It, it doesn't matter. Like, the, the revelation, I, I can sit and compare that I don't get as much revelation as Melody or Pastor Q, but in my connection with Melody and Pastor Q, you know what I'm getting? The revelation. It benefits. We, we all have something to offer. And so whatever that gift is, you know, some people have that gift to cook. Miss Denise is, is, is one of those people who opens up her home and cooks some food that everybody wants to go to Miss Denise's small group or a small group when they know she's cooking. Other people burn water. <laughs> I mean, they, they you know, it, but still, either way, when those people come together, there might be a, a, a piece of the puzzle that Miss Denise doesn't thrive in that that person has. And as we come together, we complete one another and, and build the body of Christ and in a greater way. I think it's really way. important to even think out of the box as, as more we're talking about like organic nature of small groups that doesn't have to look so organizational. And so this is, you know, it may be where you're uncomfortable to speak or to share right now, but you have a house big enough. And then we have a lot of people that they want to share, they want to, they want to cook, but they're, they don't have a house that's big enough. And so um, it's coming together that we're able to really offer these types of communities. Um, and so you do have a place um, in the body of Christ and you're, you're necessary and you're needed. And we want to encourage you to just say yes. And, you know, I think about the imagery of even Jesus saying, you know, this is entertain strangers unaware. Even Jesus saying, I was hungry and you fed me. I right. didn't have a place to go and you welcomed me in. And they said, when did we do this? They said, when you did it to the least of these, you were doing it to me. That even Jesus that stands at the door and knocks. And if you will invite me, I'll come in and dine with you. How is he doing that? It's with the body. Right. Like when we invite people into our home, we're actually inviting Christ into our home. And so this is a critical part of these communities is openness to one another and to share their lives. Yeah. Um, but we also see that these communities, these groups involved prayer, not just right. groups, but these prayer, these prayer groups had an in intentionality. We see prayer as a critical part of personal discipleship. Um, and then we call this intimacy. And this is with God and with others. Um, you want to start with prayer in the homes with God? Yeah, and, and so this is something that Jesus said 
uh, in, in Matthew 21. And then we, if you're reading through the church devotional that we're in right now, uh, we actually just read it in Mark chapter 11. He said that my house or my temple will be called a house of prayer. And so this is something that he identifies his house as a house of prayer. And, and really it should be something that our house should become a house of prayer. That it should be a normal thing to pray within our house. Whether that's praying with our spouse. Whether that's praying with our kids. Or praying with people when we bring them into the house. Because there, there's this thing of a, a lot of times prayer we see is more of a private thing and more just in between me and God. And there are some scriptures that say that. In, in Matthew chapter 6, there's a scripture that says to, to go into the, the, your closet and shut the door behind you. And the things that you pray in secret, he will reward you with openly. But there are also throughout scripture times where they prayed for one another. He even talks about, uh, you know, if somebody's struggling in sin, to pray for them. We see in John 17 that at the Last Supper that Jesus prays over his disciples and we have it written. He prays that they would be one as the Father and the Son and him are one. God make them one. And this whole long discourse that he prays about the unity that he desires for his church. How do we have that if prayer was only private? See, we have that because when you're in a corporate setting and, and things, and a corporate setting doesn't just mean in this room. It means even in your small group, among your family. When you are with other believers, it's beneficial to pray out loud over the other believers because when Jesus is praying all these things, he's praying vision for them. He's praying purpose for them. And he even prays, I'm praying this prayer, not just for the people who are in this room now, but for the people who will come to know me through these people that are in the room. And now all of those things are written down, and we are the people who came to know him through the word of the disciples. And so we know God's will for our life is that we're one, as the Father and the Spirit and the Son are one. And then there's a benefit of as you pray over people, that you connect with them. Like there, there's things that uh, touch their heart. I remember uh, a few weeks ago, we were actually at Olive Garden with uh, Tyler and Victoria. And uh, a waitress came over and she was just sharing about some things that were going on in her life. And some hard times and stuff that were there. Uh, and that she was battling through. And we just looked at her and we're like, hey, can we pray for you right now? And can you imagine kind of how awkward it would have been if I would have reached over and, and grabbed her hand and just been, <laughs> yes, Lord. Like, that would have been awkward, you know. But because we were there, I began to pray and just began to ask God to do things in her family. And just whatever God laid on my heart, I prayed in that moment. And then you watch, and she just begins to weep, and she just begins to cry. Why? Because those words were words of encouragement. Yeah. You know, when we went to Cyprus uh, two years ago, there were things that were prayed over us in a prayer room that were like things to prepare us for things that were getting ready to come. And, and we actually, they kind of have a, a thing when they start praying over individuals, they hit a record on a voice memo so that you have it, so that you can listen to it later. And I remember going and pulling these things in the fall and listening to these things. And it's like, oh my goodness, God even said this was going to happen and, and, and gave us insight and, and all of that. And when we took Addie and uh, Kylie into this prayer room, you know, it's a little different than what prayer meetings are here a lot of times. Yeah, it's a little more quiet here. The, there, there were people praying, and some were praying out loud, and then some would, they would begin to pray individually over us and things, and, and so we were just kind of interested to see what their perspective on it was, and so after we left the prayer room, after about two hours of prayer and, and, and all of this stuff, we were like, so give us some feedback. What are you thinking? And uh, Addy looked at us and he said, I'm never going to pray like an American again. <laughs> like, he's like, this was because it was so beneficial to the body. Yeah. Because even in prayer, and that's in, in Matthew 18, 19, it says, if any two or three of you would come together touching one thing and ask, I would give it to them. And, and so there's a unity in prayer. And so if we're in a corporate setting and Michael 
in his mind, he's praying for hungry kids in Africa. And Sean, in his mind, is praying for, uh, you know, the lost. And, and, and Dell, in his mind, is, is praying for politics and things. Like, we're praying, but all of our prayers are in a ton of different directions. Whereas if it's on Michael's heart to pray for hungry kids in Africa and he begins to pray, now other people can join in with his prayer and we're, we're all praying together and somebody else may pray a little bit. And then we can move over and we can begin to pray for the lost and how to minister to the lost. And then we can move over and pray for elections and our politicians <laughs> and, and all of that stuff. But when we do it, it's more powerful because we're two or three are gathering together, touching one thing and connecting in unity. Yeah, and I think, like, I really pray that our church could experience this. I, I feel like it's, it's um, a big burden of my heart when you've sat in rooms where every believer is in unity praying together yeah. and sharing what God is laying on their heart, opening their mouth, taking turns, but opening their mouth and speaking specific prayers or maybe yeah. sharing a scripture or then a word of encouragement there is something so potent about that. It, it, it feels like the upper room where they're in one accord praying right. and so empowering. You know, in Colossians, it says in uh, chapter 3, verse 16, let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with the wisdom he gives, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. You see in Corinthians where it says one should share this and the other each taking a turn. It's talking about, again, this is not coming to a prayer room prayer meeting and listening to someone else pray, but to putting our heart into really praying right. with one another. I have, and I think we have got to make praying for our friends more normal. Right. Right. Like, why is it so abnormal and awkward for a Christian to pray for their, the, the people they love or and to pray for a stranger? Asking for prayer. Yes. And the to vulnerability, ask for prayer. because when I, when I share something that's going on in my heart and in my life and a struggle that allows people in to see that, and that vulnerability, that, that closeness makes you more intimate. It, it brings a, a greater unity. And then when you're sharing my heart and we're doing like, if I'm broken about something and you're weeping, like it, it, it's taught, weep with those that weep, rejoice with those that rejoice. Like it, throughout scripture, this, this is kind of repeated and stuff. And that connection and that unity just grows even greater as we do that. And, and so it's not only the connection in between us and God, but when we begin to understand how we pray together, it grows a greater intimacy in between us and man. And, and we have that greater, greater connection and missionality and things. And I would say on the other end, it's also vulnerable to pray with someone when you don't know them. It requires you to be, you to be weak and depend on God. And so I've, I don't really know what it means, but I hear this a lot. I don't pray good. I hear people tell me that. Like, yeah. I don't pray good. I don't. Listen, there is no right or wrong. Like, yeah. I, I think, guys, we have to look. Some of this in our growth is to learn to just take a step of faith yeah. and to open your mouth. It does not have to be eloquent. It does right. not have to be right. deep or theological. It has to be marked by love that I love my brother or sister enough to when they have a burden of their heart, not to say, I'll pray for you and go home and forget about it. Right. But right there, take this opportunity to open my mouth and pray with them. Right. And I'm telling you, when you do this, the Spirit of God meets you there. He says, there are two or three are gathered. I'm in their midst. And so guys, this this. This P part of GPS, we can have the groups and we can have the serve, but if we don't Doubtless. have this connection to God, this prayer, this intimacy around the word, then God, guys, it's a formula that's devoid of power. It's a form of godliness denying the power thereof. We can meet at homes all we want. We can get out in the streets and serve all we want. We can serve in children's, but if there is not an intimacy and a potency yeah. with the power of prayer, then we've lost the whole point. And so there's this, there's this connection that goes with these three things. The groups is where discipleship and the study of the word of God and things go so that we have something to offer people. The, the prayer is something where we can connect them to God and, and things in that moment and pray for the equipping to have the right things to say, the right things to do and stuff for the S, which is to serve. And, and so they all interact because as we serve, we shouldn't just be 
like giving food to people or doing things like the goal should be that the service opens up opportunity for us to share some of the word of God for the opportunity for us to pray over the individuals and things and that's what makes us different from just like a soup kitchen or or something like that is we because we're being discipled and trained and and the word of God is in us and we're studying the word of God we're we're able to in moments share the word of God with people and we're able to take moments and pray with people and things and 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 again we don't want to go into the mission without first praying for the empowerment and that's what Jesus even with his disciples the last step was go into the upper room and wait and then you're going to be empowered and you're going to be a witness in Jerusalem Judea Samaria and other most parts of the world and and that was the empowerment to go serve the body of Christ by not just serving food but distributing clothing or distributing the word of God or or praying for one another and and ministering to one another and and so this this call to serve is a call to begin to step into the field of Christ to begin to become co-laborers with Christ Jesus to where we don't just receive the benefits of other people's labor but the benefits that we've received now we invest into the lost or into a community or a new generation of believers. I think that, you know, when we swing back to this relation, this intentional biblical relational apprenticeship, I think that um, most of us really don't understand the potency and the necessity of serving to our discipleship. Right. Like how important serving in God's house, in his field, is to your own personal growth. Right. Again, Hebrew culture is, is about immersive learning. And so even for Passover, you know, you dip things into salty water and taste it so you can remember the tears. that They're, they're not just telling the story about the exodus to their kids. Yeah. They're immersing themselves in the story. They're tasting bitter things to remind them of bitter tears. They are immersing themselves in the story because, again, more is caught than taught. And so when we, we see Jesus' small group didn't just study, they got in the field. And right. as they were in the field with Jesus, they saw Jesus. They, they, they saw him washing feet. Right. And they learned, oh, to be a leader means be a servant. Oh, it's not going to be jockeying position. That's not what he's doing. Rabbi is teaching us by doing it. They saw it. They saw how he interacted with Gentiles and with women. And they, oh, why is he talking to this woman? Oh, maybe we should include women in this thing. I mean, they saw it because they were up next to him. As they did ministry alongside Jesus. And guys, so when we're serving in God's house or out in the streets alongside maybe somebody that's in a higher chair than us, a chair three, a chair four, we get alongside that area. We, we start to learn what it's like to be a disciple. Right. I think about my own personal discipleship. This is how I was discipled. And this is why I said many of you may already be doing this. You don't realize you're discipled. Right. That when you invite that newer believer to lunch and you're having coffee or you go watch them play ball or when you are, that, that is relational discipleship. Right. That when you ask someone to come serve with you and kids and they get to see how you play with those kids and teach the word, that is discipleship. You're discipling them. You're bringing them along in your sphere relationally right. and out in the field to serve and they're learning, they're growing. And I think about me. Like as this 16-year-old, 15-year-old broken girl, I look back and my pastor's wife who's with Jesus now, but I look back and, and I, I just was like wanted to be, I gravitated to her. I wanted to be, to be, I just saw Jesus in her. And so I would just hung out with this 40-year-old, I called her my 40-year-old best friend. I just hung out with her because all my friends were crazy and I wanted to try to serve Jesus. And so, but as I'm helping her with her kids or, or, or printing out bulletins or serving in children, I got to see her be like Jesus. And she, I was learning from her. I think about a lot of the things that make me who I am as a pastor's wife today that is loud and creative and thinks and realizes that's okay. And I look back now after she died, I realized she was teaching me those things without even calling it that. Right. I was watching. I was being discipled. Pastor Cindy, like learning how to serve my kids and love my husband sacrificially. These were things that just being around her serving right. in her sphere taught me. I think about Tab Wood and, and many of the people, anybody that's been discipled by me, it's most likely because they were in my sphere serving with me. And over time, relationally, 
They got to, as they, were, they got to see how we interacted and, or something came up about their marriage and I was able to help. Well, this is what the scripture says about that because we were just together. Guys, it's a whole lot more organic than we realize, but I'm telling you, we've got to move. To move to that third chair is so important that you are serving. Serving is a part of how you're growing. If you're not serving, you may not be growing. Just getting, a, getting in his field and not just for you though, but for Christ because he cares about the flock. Right. He cares about the sheep. Right. And so we want to be intentional and, and careful because if we realize that ministry is part of what disciples people, sometimes you can use people for ministry and, and try to get them to do things in that, in that aspect. But Jesus, he used ministry to develop the people. That, that's what he did. As he's walking along, he's, he's, they're doing ministry together. And in those ministry moments, it, it's opportunities for him to speak truth. It's opportunities for him to, to teach a lesson. It's, it's opportunity for him to pull him aside and say, hey, did you understand what I meant when I did that? Do you, you know, to, to enhance that and connect. And, and I think a lot of times, you know, I talk about how Pastor Mark is like a spiritual father to me. But it wasn't because we sat down and just studied the Word of God together. It was because we worked in the field together. Like we did ministry together. Our, our meetings were about finances or about strategy or about upcoming events or, or, or things like that. And, and so as I'm doing, I'm learning how to organize. I'm learning how to structure. I'm learning how to, to lead, like all these different things. And it wasn't just him sitting down. There were opportunities where I'm learning the word of God through what I'm seeing demonstrated in his life, not necessarily even just the words that he was saying to me in those moments. And so it's the same thing with some of you. There's probably people that you're investing things like that in that are teaching them scriptural, biblical methods and things to help them along the way that even just with a little more intentionality and awareness to say, hey, do you realize why I did this this way? Because if I would have done it this way, this person could have been offended or this could have happened, but I did it this way so that I could make sure that we could reach these people. And then you, it, it's a discipleship, natural thing as you serve I together. love that. I love just, it's just the intentionality. And I mean, some of you, maybe if you're a ministry leader, like who, and you're, you're like, who do I disciple? Start with the people who are in your sphere right now. Yeah. I mean, if you're wondering, just look around you. Look who's already doing life with you and and just start being intentional. I think yeah. starting just there. But I, I want to read. We're going to kind of close with John 21, uh, 15. This is after Peter has fallen and Jesus has resurrected. And Jesus goes and pulls him off of the boat again one last time. And he, he tells this to Simon Peter. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord. He replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs. Verse 16, he repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep. And he asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. Uh, I'm sorry. And he asked the question a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Then he said, then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were young, when you're in that chair too, you're a babe in Christ. You were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself, went wherever you wanted to go. But when you're old, as you mature in your faith, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. And Jesus said this to let him know about what kind of death he would glorify God. And then Jesus told them, follow me. He's like, Peter, if you really want to follow me, remember the first thing he said to Peter was, come follow me. Right. And now here again, he's saying, do you want to continue to follow me because I'm out in the field? And as you grow, the natural progression of discipleship is we become less and less selfish and more and more, it's not about me anymore. My heart is beating for what his heart is beating for. Guys, I'm telling you right now, the harvest is plentiful. It's the laborers that are few and the call of the father for laborers.